Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for being here for this very special conversation on the anniversary of Anne Frank's birthday. I'm here with Dina Kraft, who has just published um, a with Hannah Pick Goslar. Um, here's my copy of the book um, uh, with Hannah Pick Goslar, who was Anne Frank's very close childhood friend, a memoir of Hannah's life um, in the places that it intersected with Anne's and also in the places where it diverged from Anne's story. So it's really a, a fascinating book, um, not only for the perspective it gives us on Anne's life, which of course is so, so well known and so important to so many people, but also for the ways that it shows us what was going on outside that very narrow confined space of the annex in the, during the Holocaust in the Netherlands as it took place. Um, so we, we know Hannah now primarily for her friendship with Anne, but what this book shows is how truly multi multi-dimensional her life was, um, starting with her birth in Germany, in Berlin, um, to a very prominent German Jewish family, then emigrating to the Netherlands, what happened to her during the war, and the story of her survival and her life afterwards. Um, so we're going to we're going to be talking about her life, um, how her story was typical of Dutch Jews during the Netherlands, during excuse me, Jews in the Netherlands during the Holocaust, the ways that it was less typical, um, and her own extraordinary personality. Um, so just to open us up, I've asked Dina to choose a passage from the book that gives us a sense of who Hannah was and what her voice was like. And Dina, maybe you just could now introduce that passage a little bit before you start reading. Yeah, sure. So this passage takes place just about a year after she, um, Hannah has been liberated from Bergen-Belsen. Hannah is deported um, and, and taken to Bergen-Belsen, where she spends about a year um, and survives with her sister. In the process, she loses her father and her grandparents. Um, and this is a passage where Hannah is recuperating. Um, she's She weighs about 30 kilos after the war. Um and she's very, very sick and she's recuperating in Switzerland and she has a happy visit from um, Mr. Frank, as she calls him. And so I still call him Mr. Frank as well. Um, and um, yeah, I'll just dive in. She describes, she says, it was a brief but wonderful visit. I was happy to be able to show him how visibly on the mend I was, slowly gaining weight and strength. I was hungry for connection to him and anyone from my previous life. The one such connection came out of the blue and astonished me. While I was living in Switzerland, Mr. Frank broke the news that for the whole time they were in hiding, Anne had carried on writing in her diary, the one we were all so curious about and that Jacques and I had looked for in her bedroom when the, when the family suddenly vanished and it had been saved. After the Dutch police discovered the inhabitants of the secret attic and arrested them, Meep Gies, who had worked for Mr. Frank and helped hide them, had found the treasure diary. She bundled the pages together, unread, and placed them in a locked desk drawer of her desk. She told herself she'd give it back to Anne when she returned. The day Mr. Frank told her that Anne and Margot would never be coming home, she unlocked the drawer and handed him the diary. Mr. Frank told me that for a while he couldn't even look at the pages. It was just too painful. When he did finally sit down and begin to work his way through it, he was transfixed by its contents. He started sharing excerpts with some family members and friends, including me. They were a revelation. I lost my best friend, Anne, when she had just turned 13 and, beginning, and, and, beginning, and began keeping her diary. And in those pages, I felt I was reunited with her. It was such a strange sensation to witness her evolve and mature, all while having a window into her internal life and into her life in hiding. The Anna I had met in the most terrible of circumstances at Bergen-Belsen was starving and desperate, hardly the vivacious girl I knew. These precious pages allowed me to see her between those two moments. The writing was so rich and vivid, I felt like I was right next to her again. It felt both euphoric and heart-shattering. I ached knowing she had written many of those words while still living so close to me, but all the time I was thinking she was hundreds of miles away, safe. I imagined her trying I imagined her trying to mute her coughs while she was sick and her footsteps during the day, always living with the backdrop of fear that they might get caught. I was profoundly moved not only by her talent for describing the events and dynamics among the eight in hiding, 
but her rich inner world, her thoughts and her feelings, her observations of others hiding in the attic on Prince Grat. <laughs> For all of her maturity, she was a teenager, still very much the beginning of her life. I related to her desire to feel true love, to feel truly understood by someone else and her longing to quote, have a good time for once and to laugh so hard it hurts. She was so vibrant, so alive. I felt scrubbed raw reading her words. I miss my friend more than I could have ever expressed. I think that it's so, that's so lovely. And of course it's so poignant to picture, you know, not only Hannah, but of course also Otto Frank reading Anne's diary after the war, um, knowing that she was gone and the ways that they must have reacted to it as people who were so close to her. Um, I thought let's let's back up a little bit and look at Hannah's life up to the point where she first encountered Anne, as she mm-hmm. you know, talks a little bit about how they were friends together in the neighborhood. Um mm-hmm before the Holocaust. Um, can you just paint a little picture of what their lives were like then? Yeah. I mean, one of the things Hannah always spoke to me was about how safe and protected it felt and how it really showed her that you can be living your life and you can be playing hopscotch and um, hide and seek like she and Hannah and, 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 and um, Anne did. Um, and then it can be snatched away from you in a second. Um, she always went back to like the this, this suddenness of having this sort of Eden of the sorts taken away from them. But they lived in a Southern Amsterdam neighborhood called, I'm going to butcher the Dutch, but Riverbert, Riverbert, the river district. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an area that um, had brand new apartment buildings for the time. They were quite luxurious. They had hot running water um, and um, they were considered quite expensive. And of course there was a you know, a world, um, a depression going on in the early 1930s when Hannah and Anna's families arrived. Um, I'm going to call her Anna because I spent all this time with Hannah and she always called her Anna. So in my mind, she's Anna. So and I'm going to call her Anna, 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 and Anna I'm used to her in an American context and we all know her as Anne Frank, but. Right, <laughs> right. So, so um, in the early 1930s, there was these, this, this new neighborhood and the landlords were very excited, the owners to have German Jews, the sort of influx of German Jews who some of them had some money, some money at least, um, to be able to afford the rents there. And so it became this, um, you know, it was a mix of, of Dutch, uh, you know, Dutch, Jew, Dutch, but also a, a non-Jewish du- and Jewish Dutch and Dutch, but also a lot of German speaking Jews um, to the point that it was called, um, I think it's sometimes little Berlin. And there was a, um, there was a tram from, from central, from central Amsterdam to, uh, to their neighborhood. That was also, that also played on, I think it was called the Berlin express. Right. Um so uh, there was a lot of you know German being spoken in the air, and it was actually it was um, when when just when Hannah Hannah had just moved from Berlin, her father was a really interesting character. He was a prominent journalist um, in Berlin, and he was also the head of the government press office for the Prussian government as part of the Weimar government. He was very active in Weimar um, and a very outspoken critic of Hitler. And he of course was fired when. And Hitler came to power, which is part of what expedited their their uh, journey to um, out, out of Germany. Wow. So um, how old would Hannah been when they came to the Netherlands? She was just four. She was four years old, and um, and she had gone to a grocery store one of their very first days in the corner grocery store, and um, she heard she and her mother overheard another mother and her, her daughter uh, speaking in German. So the two mothers started chatting and the two girls kind of shyly looked at each other and kind of clung to the, the mother's skirts. And that was it. And then a couple of days later was time for Anna's first day of nursery school. She was going to uh, um, the Montessori nursery school. Her parents were very progressive and were looking for progressive education for their daughter. And there was a Montessori school. So off she went, much to her heart, to school, although she didn't speak a word of Dutch and she didn't know a single person in Amsterdam and she was very nervous. And she was, unlike Anna, she was not so boisterous. She was more um, a shyer sort of girl. Um, She was the only child. Um, She was uh, very close to her parents and she was extremely nervous about that first day of school. She did not want to leave. She was like clinging to the doorknob. She did not want to leave um, her apartment. Um, when she gets to the, when she gets into the classroom, um, she and her mother meet with a teacher and they start exchanging some words. 
Uh, she watches the children who are all active in different activities across the classroom. Um, and across the room, she sees a little girl with short, sort of sheeny, dark, dark hair and a bob. Um, and the girl is playing bell, play, a set of silver bells. And she turns around and she realizes that she recognizes this little girl. And they, uh, she's a little girl from the grocery store. And Anna rushes to her arms wide open and they embrace and they hug. And from that day forward, they are um, the best of friends. And um, Ruth Gosler, uh, Hannah's mother, quite relieved, creeps out quietly <laughs> and lets the two girls bond. Um, and not only do the two girls bond to become very close friends, so does the Frank family and the Gosler family. Um, they That's become a sweet yeah. story. Um, and, you know, shows us a little capsule of what their lives were like then. Um, you know, these two little girls just having come from Germany, Hannah from Berlin and from Frankfurt, Amsterdam must have seemed so foreign to them, especially, you know, not speaking the language. And But they lived in this little, you know, as you said, in this little German Jewish enclave. Um, can we talk a little bit about what their life was like in the Netherlands compared to what it was like back in Germany? Yeah, it was a bit of a shock for her, the parents. Um, they had both come from, you know, upper middle class backgrounds. You know, Hannah lived in an apartment right near the Reichstag across from the Tiergarten, which is, of course, this big public garden in, um, in Berlin. Uh, she used to like to go watch the elephants in the zoo, um, to go on strolls through the Rose Garden with her father. She would visit her father at the Reichstag um, where he had an office. Um, <laughs> there were, you know, there were, you know, uh, there was help in the house. There were maids. Uh, her mother wore beautiful evening gowns for the events. She had to go to the official government events with her father. Um, it was all in all, you know, a really sort of beautiful life they had in Berlin. At the same time, she was hearing from her bed the sounds of the marches in the streets. The Reichstag, the night it was on fire, the smoke came through her bedroom window. I mean, she was feeling and experiencing um in her most early memories, uh, what was happening in Berlin and sort of the, the spiraling of, 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 of Hitler's ascent. Um, so despite all the stress in the house, you know, she only experienced sort of the good and um, her parents, it was especially stressful. They had gone from this like sort of luxurious apartment to a, although it was a perfectly nice apartment, a much smaller living quarters. Um, they were away from their families who they were very close to. Um, and her father, who had been this prominent position, suddenly found himself sort of eking, a, scratching, a li living together, um, together with another German family friend, um, Mr. Lederman, Franz Lederman, and uh, who was a lawyer. And her father used his skills, and together they created sort of a, a two-person um, refugee agency for other German Jews who were escaping and finding refuge in Holland. And Hannah's mother, who had been a school teacher originally, um, she was the only typist of the three. So they set up shop in the family living room, and uh, they created this, this office there. Um, but for especially for Hannah's mother, she was incredibly homesick. She missed she, you know, Berlin felt much more cosmopolitan to her th than Amsterdam it did. Uh, Dutch was very difficult for all of them um, uh, to learn, not so much for Hannah, but for her parents. Her mother called Dutch, uh, she said it was a throat condition, <laughs> not a language. <laughs> um, and she and the other mothers, including Mrs. Frank and Mrs. Lederman, um, they talked about sort of the difficulties and the challenges of suddenly raising their children without nannies and cooks and, and whatnot. Um, and the one hand, it was also sort of good. They liked kind of getting their, as, as, as one of the, um, one of the friends, Barbara Laterman later recounted that the mothers liked getting their hands back on their kids, you know, because they weren't, you know, there wasn't the sort of the, 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 the nannies and the, and the, and the help in the house and whatnot was not there anymore. So they were very much hands on. Um, and the neighborhood was, you know, it was a new neighborhood, but there was a Mervader plane, which was a, a square in front of their house. Um, the apartments were like three, it's like three stories, um, sort of gray colored brick buildings. Um, Hannah could open her window and shout down to Anna, who was in the building next to hers. They had a special whistle that they used to call each other. It was the um, a telling note of like how sort of Dutch they soon came to feel. It was the Dutch national anthem. Anna wasn't a great whistler. So sometimes she would just sort of hum. Um, and off they would go and scamper and play in the playground. There was a third little girl named Sana, Sana Lederman, who was the daughter of this lawyer that worked with um, Hannah's parents. And they were a bit of a threesome. They were known um, as Sana, Hannah, and Anna. Um, and lots of time playing gymnastics and dancing and, um, um, and a lot of time in that park, a lot of time outside just playing until their mothers would call them home. 
Yeah. So, you know, even though the adults struggled and they missed Germany, apparently Edith Frank apparently used to talk about how much she missed the pastries and how the Dutch, mm-hmm. Dutch baked goods were not up to the standard. Um, you know, it, despite their homesickness, it sounds, you know, so ideal, really such an idyllic childhood. And then, of course, in May 1940, the Nazis invade the Netherlands. Um, so what what happened to Hannah then? What was yeah. did, did she what, what, what were her memories of the invasion like? Yeah. So it's like the Reichstag fire all over again. Right. She's got the same sounds outside her window. Yeah. I mean, terrible fear. She woke up from her bed early that morning, the morning um, that the uh, German bombing began 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 she uh an invasion began she thought it was thunder she was hearing it was the roar of planes um but she immediately thought it was thunder and she jumped into her parents bed and they all at first thought it was thunder and then her parents drew open the windows and they saw the planes going by according to some accounts you could even see the swastikas on the on the planes and her parents um, first put on the radio um, um, and then suddenly turned to the fact that they could possibly be in danger themselves as German refugees. Um, Her father in particular thought he was sort of a public enemy number one type because he'd been so outspoken against the regime. Um, They immediately started going through papers, papers Hannah didn't even know they had, all sorts of papers that he'd brought with him from Germany. All of a sudden they were being ripped into tiny pieces and Hannah's job was to put those teeny tiny pieces of paper into the toilet and flush the toilet um, um, because her father, for whatever reason, thought they were incriminating. Um, and um, at one point, her mother looks across the room and sees this bust of Otto Brown. Otto Brown was the um, prime minister of Weimar, uh, sorry, of, 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 sorry of, of Prussia. And he was also um, Hannah's father's boss. And he, of course, was a big you know, enemy of, of the Nazis. So uh, they had this large bust. They had to do something with Again, they assumed that any minute there'd be a knock on the door. So suddenly her mother and father were lugging this this Otto Frank, not Otto Frank, this Otto Brown uh, bronze statue down to the sidewalk There's and like shoving it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And but when she got outside, it wasn't just her family that was in a stir getting rid of any kind of incriminating evidence. Everybody else was also getting rid of their incriminating evidence. They were also throwing things away um, and lighting things on fire. Um, and there was this real feeling of panic. Um, uh, two things I just want to mention. One is that, again, um, her father, Hans Gosler, believes he'll be wanted and he'll be arrested. So he darts off uh, along with uh, many other people to the coast, to this town along the, on the Dutch coast, hoping against hope that he will be able to get a, uh, a boat across the, cha- across the water to England. Um, but although tens of thousands descend, I think only a couple of hundred people were lucky enough to go. Uh, among those that were lucky enough to go were the, was the, uh, the queen of Holland and her entire family and the entire Dutch cabinet, which of course was a blow when they heard of the radio that they, they had left, right? That they had, that the, the, the Germany, that Holland had fallen to the Germans and that their beloved queen, who they really looked up to, you know, on a very personal level. And I know you know this from knowing Anna's story, Anna's story so well, like they really adored the royal family and Hannah and Anna would, you know, follow news coverage of them. And they had postcards of the royal family. Um, so that really felt like a, a gut punch that they had sort of been abandoned. So her father goes off to the coast, hoping to get a boat. He does not succeed. He ends up staying in hiding for several weeks until he comes home, though. Um, and everyone's waiting for, you know, doom to fall. But as as you know, um, maybe your audience doesn't know this, but it was a very slow um the Germans had a very slow burn, basically, on, on their hold on Holland. They, they were in control, but it was called the Velvet Glove. Um, they, they ruled at first as if nothing had changed and kind of kept things very, 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 very steady. Um, and so people eventually began to relax and think maybe it would be OK. After all, they could just ride right through this right through this moment. Right. People became complacent. And then the obviously, of course, the regulations start coming down. Jewish property is seized. Jews aren't allowed to work in certain first in certain businesses, then of course, in almost all businesses. Um, And then of course, Jewish students have to go to separate schools. And that is something that Hannah and Anne wind up experiencing together, right? They wind up um, at the Jewish Lyceum, um, the most, I guess the biggest and uh, Mm -hmm. sort of the most 
prestigious of these new schools that are set up. Um, and yeah, one thing I was interested in, um, I've done some research into the Lyceum myself for my book, um, and you talk about how it was a kind of an extraordinary atmosphere at the school um, where teachers from all over the city, you know, from colleges, students from all over come together, you know, under these, um, you know, very tense and scary circumstances. And the teachers really kind of resolved to make it the best, to make the best they could of it and provide these students with, um, with a, a, a special and, you know, very unusual education in the, in this situation. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, these were, these were the best teachers. These are the best sort of crop of Jewish teachers teaching across Amsterdam. And they all kind of came together in this school um, and the standards were incredibly high. They seemed to make a decision, you know, to sort of keep the focus on ac high academics and high challenge, but also a real sense of community. Um, and as part of that community, they also brought in um, teaching Jewish history. They learned about the Inquisition, they learned other, other sort of important moments in Jewish history. And there was this real sort of deep feeling of solidarity and also just fun in the classrooms. You know, they really sort of became close with one another and new friendships were made. And of course, you know, this was the year they were 13. So they were, you know, crushes on boys and, and then, you know, they were kids that would go, um, it was the, uh, sort of the sort of way you would see that, you know, a boy and a girl were interested in each other. You would see who would leave on their bicycles and hold hands together by bicycle. Um, you no, know, you mentioned that detail in your book. I can't even imagine it being, you know, being sort of a non expert bicycle rider myself, how you would ride your bike while, while holding hands with someone at the same time. <laughs> that's your good on the Dutch are good on bicycles, I guess. Right. Just, yeah. Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, the bicycles were eventually taken away. Right. That was part of the anti-Jewish laws that they, they couldn't go on the tram and they couldn't go on. They couldn't they couldn't ride their bicycles anymore. They had to get their, get their bicycles away. So gradually, you know, thing by thing was being taken away from them. And so their their world, they were sort of in some ways, they were just sort of branching out into this beautiful world of the Lyceum and all these new friends and new experiences. Um, their world also was becoming much smaller because they couldn't go very far. You know, um, there's also curfews. Um, so they, you know, they made fun themselves friends and their homes, no more non-Jewish friends. No, no more than John. And, and, and Hannah and Anna had been at this Montessori school that was very mixed Jewish and non-Jewish. And they didn't even know actually who were the Jewish kids and who were the Dutch kids in some situations. Um, I mean, Hannah was, you know, her father had become religious during World War One, which is sort of an interesting turn. He um, during the war, he uh, was in, was posted in Lithuania and he encountered Hasidic Jews. And although he was super secular, had grown up with a Christmas tree, he became enamored by the, the, the idea of Jewish family and community and um, and became an observant Jew. And so they were Jewish. They were observant also in Amsterdam and um, they would have Shabbat dinners, which the Franks would attend. Um, and actually, you know, Otto Frank was not very learned Jewishly. Uh, Edith was uh, much more so and much more connected to Jewish tradition than Otto was. But uh, but every every Friday night, they said the Kiddush, you know, the, pr the traditional prayer over the wine. And um, apparently what Anna told me was that at Auschwitz later on, when Otto Frank was liberated and they were, they were actually still in the camp until they were released officially from the camp, they had some sort of Shabbat ceremony and Otto Frank recited the Kaddish, the, 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 um, sorry, the Kiddush, because he knew it from the Goslar table. Yeah. So, okay. So there, that brings us right up to um, the door of the annex closing behind Anne, really. So they're only in this beautiful school for a year um, together, right? Hannah was there longer. Anne only attends for a year. And then um, during the summer in July, right after the school year ends, um, right, actually right at the same time that they have this graduation and promotion ceremony for their first class, um, they learn that the Germans are issuing these call-up notices, uh, which go out to anyone over between the ages of 16 and 40. In the beginning, a lot of German Jews were targeted as immigrants, as you know. And a lot of the students from the Jewish Lyceum, including Anne's sister, Margot, were on this first list of call-up notices. And so that's, of course, what um, sparks the Frank's decision to go into hiding right then. Um, Otto Frank has been preparing their hiding place and, you know, in the back of his office building in downtown Amsterdam. Um, they weren't planning to use it quite so soon, but once Margaret gets this call-up notice, they realize they can't wait any longer and they disappear. 
what happened to Hannah then? Yeah. So Hannah is one of the, fir- is the first, actually, one of the very first to know that the Frank family is gone. Um, her mother had a scale. She wanted to return to Mrs. Frank for making jam because that was what the Frank family, you know, part of their business. And she was returning the scale and she also wanted to play with, with Anna. It was one of the first days of summer vacation. So she knocks on the door and for the first time in her memory, someone who is not a Frank opens the door and it's, um, it's the border, um, Mr. Gold. Something, I'm forgetting his last name. Uh, Goldschmidt, it's something like Mr. That. Goldschmidt. Yeah. So Mr. Goldschmidt, kind of a surly guy, according to Hannah and Anna, uh, opens the door and says, they're gone. You know, uh, don't you know? Didn't you know this? <laughs> um, they went to Switzerland um, or appears that they've gone to Switzerland. And of course, Hannah's in complete shock um, and knows, of course, that Anna has a grandmother and cousins and family in Switzerland. So that connection makes sense to her on some level. But she goes, she hurries back to her family and tells this to her parents who seemingly are shocked. I kind of wonder if they may have known if there was anybody, if any, if anybody, the Frank family would have told, I imagine it maybe would have been the Gossler family, but anyway, they didn't let on that that was the case. Um, and um, some speculation, I think that they would, that they may have asked the Goslars to consider going into hiding with them. There are f- few people apparently who say that the Franks asked them to go into hiding with them, but the, the Goslars wouldn't have been able to do that because Hannah had this much younger sister, right? Who was around right. age two at two, this time. Two. And not only that, she had Gabby, Gabby, her little sister, but she also had a, a a potential sibling on the way. Her mother was pregnant at this point. She was already pregnant. Um, right. Okay. She was already pregnant. So it was really, and this is why when Hannah was asked later. Yeah. When Hannah was asked later, like, aren't you upset? You weren't invited. She said, well, no, of course not. There was no way it would have been much too dangerous to go with in this situation. Um, so she informs her parents and, um, and she, and the second person she tells people after her, after her mother and father is of course their mutual, very close friend, Jacques, Jacqueline, Um, and, um, and they decide to come back to the Frank apartments and they are allowed back in, um, by, um, by, uh, the, the border and they want to see, they're just really curious. They want to see what, what, what Anna left behind. They want to see if they, they want to see if Anna also left them any letters. They were like, kind of, kind of astonished. And she promised, um, letters like that. She promised she would leave letters for her friends if she wanted. Right. Right. She specifically promised the shock a letter if anything was to happen. Um, and so they were determined to sort of find this farewell note and, you know, they were like detectives. They wanted to sort of know what was going on and kind of piece this, 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 this terribly confusing news together. And they, um, and when they go into, uh, her room, they're also looking for something her diary, because she had told them very cheekily. So that she had written down a list of all the people in their class and what she thought of them, you know? So they were really, they wanted to see um, what she'd written about them and their friends. Um, And they are shocked to see that um, the the diary is gone, not shocked. They're shocked. The the, the, the diary is gone, but they were shocked to see that a lot of things that Anna really liked, including a pair of new shoes, things she'd just gotten for her birthday and some of her favorite books and games were still on the shelf. You know, they were really surprised by that, by what she hadn't taken. They're also surprised by the state of the apartment. Um, the Frank family uh, intentionally made it look like they left in a rush. So their beds were unmade. The breakfast dishes were still in the sink. Um, and uh, and then maybe the, the biggest clue that something was really awry uh, was that I'm going to mispronounce her name. Maybe you know how to pronounce it. Morchi, Morchi, Muchi, the cat. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Morchi. Mucha, sorry, Mucha. I think it was a black cat, if I'm not mistaken, um, who was Anne's like beloved pet, was still there. Um, and there was some meat that was left for the. the they they bought some meat from the butcher. The um, and the, and, the, and the border told them, "Don't worry, you know the the cat is going to a different neighbor. It's okay." But that was very confusing because you know it didn't really add up. Why would why would Anna, if she could, leave her beloved cat behind? You know, so that was confusing. Um, so, yeah, so they, so, you know, and, and then it, that's, that's the last time uh, that they see, well, for Jacques, that's the last time that she sees Anne. Hannah is going to encounter her then right. a little later on. Right. But let's right. talk in the meantime, let's talk about what happens to Hannah um, before she winds up in Bergen-Belsen. So her family wound, winds up 
um, being able to stick it out in Amsterdam for quite some time, right? Owing to her father's position, her father works for the Jewish Council, which was um, this organization that uh, was sort of helped to liaison between the Jewish community and the occupiers. Um, lots of people have very strong feelings about the Jewish Council and their role in, you know, trying to preserve certain um, of the Jews in the Netherlands, while apparently, you know, allowing to, the, you know, allowing the Nazis to deport others of them. Of course, none of this was within their control at all. They made this, um, they made a bargain to um, try to stall for time, thinking that the occupation, there's no way that the occupation would last as long as it did. And um, if they were able to just kind of to keep delaying uh, the Nazis into, from deporting, you know, as, if they tried to delay as many deportations as they could, they hoped that they would be able to save the Jews that way. Of course, we know that that's not how it worked out, but Hannah's yeah. family were among the beneficiaries of the system since her father was an employee of the Jewish council. And they also bought, um, they bought passports, right, for um a South American country. And that was another way in which Jews, some Jews managed to um, to preserve them, themselves at least for a little while because um, the Nazis felt that certain of these Jews with privileged positions or foreign citizenship um, could potentially at some point be traded, be exchanged for German prisoners of war. Um, so we see um, Hannah benefiting from this system um, in a way that Anne didn't. Um, you know, we think about when we think about the Holocaust in the Netherlands. Um, for one thing, um, you know, I think we have we haven't mentioned this yet, but the Holocaust was disastrous for the population of Jews in the Netherlands. Um, Seventy-five percent of them died of death rate, the highest death rate in all of Western Europe. Um, and there's this perception that I think really only in recent years has begun to be countered a bit um, that the Dutch saved their Jews, um, that they, you know, that the Dutch citizens pitched in and took care of them and hid them partially, you know, because the by far the most famous story is Anne's story. And that is, you know, what happened to the Franks. Of course, they weren't saved, um, but they went into hiding thanks to their um, relationships with Otto's employees and colleagues who um, volunteered to, you know, very generously took care of them while they were in hiding. Um, whereas Hannah's the family arrangement was very different. Can we, let's, uh, let's talk about what yeah. happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted just to say something quickly is that Hannah herself until fairly recent years actually believed that sort of Dutch myth of like the, the of the, that they protected their Jews in, in, in greater numbers than perhaps their places, which of course was not at all the case. Um, but uh, Anna and family disappear, right? They're, they're suddenly gone. Um, and a couple of nights later, a terrible thing happens. The deportation of those teenagers, that teenage call up um, begins. Uh, people like Margot, um, who, who would have been on that in that, in that very first level of in that very first deportation of young people. Uh, among them was also Alfred, Alfred Block. He was 15 years old, 15. Um, and he was Hannah's boyfriend. Um, they were friends from synagogue and he was a very sweet boy with sort of freckles and a big smile. And um, they had a sort of shy, sort of quiet little romance. And um, he came to the door to say that he had um, been given a summons and he would be leaving. And he sort of pressed into Hannah's hand a picture of the Kotel, of the of the Western Wall in Jerusalem, like the holiest site in, in Judaism, a picture he had drawn for her. Um, and he asked her to wait for him. And um, and, uh, and it was through her, she sort of, you know, through, through him, she realized, you know, that this, this deportation of, of, of teenagers was happening. Um, I don't think she connected it necessarily to Margot's disappearance, although perhaps her parents did. Um, and that the, those, those 16, 15 and 16 year olds, again, mostly German Jewish children um, uh, were summoned at 2 a.m., which of course was past curfew. And they were told to meet at the central train station in Amsterdam. I remember I described that Mervader plane, that sort of that um, sort of grassy square that was in front of their buildings. Um, if you looked out of the window that night at 2 a.m., you would have seen all of these I was emotional shadows of these children, you know, with their bed rolls and their rug sacks, you know, quietly walking. They couldn't take the tram, right? They had to walk across town a couple of kilometers to the train station. You no, know, their parents could not escort them. Um, 
I actually but, heard you know, that story. When I was told to take all kinds of things with them as if they were in fact going to labor service in Germany, as it was called. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there were girls who took lipstick with them and nice shirts because they thought maybe they'd have like, they, they thought it might actually be fun. They thought it might be sort of like a, like camp, like a summer camp kind of thing where you'd work at night and you sit around the fire and you'd like sing songs and, you know, play guitar, whatever it might be. They, they didn't know what to think. This was very early days, you know, um, they hadn't gotten to the stage of people being deported and not coming back yet, you know? One thing that's uh, striking actually is when you talk about Hannah at Westerbork, um, the Dutch transit camp um, where Jews were brought from Amsterdam and elsewhere in the Netherlands before being deported east, usually to Auschwitz, sometimes also to Sobibor or Theresienstadt. Um, when, and Hannah and her father wind up staying there and her sister wind up staying there for some time before they're eventually deported to Bergen-Belsen. But one thing that I found so striking um, was you talk about how even, even at uh, Westerbork, she doesn't know what, she doesn't know where those trains are going. The trains leave Westerbork every Tuesday, like clockwork. Um, and mm -hmm. everybody knows that it's terrible to be selected um, for that deportation list to go to the East, but they don't know what's happening to the people who leave. No, no, there's, there, I, mean, I believe that some of them understood, you know, not only that it was bad, but that it was probably certain death, yeah. but they didn't necessarily have the tools or language to express that. I mean, um, you know, we now know what we now have a word genocide. We have a word, the Holocaust. They didn't have those words in their lexicon. That sort of mass industrial killing hadn't happened in history yet. It was about to happen to their people. Right. But they, they didn't, they didn't, again, they didn't, they couldn't wrap their heads around it. It was just sort of too big. Almost. They did know that. Yes. I think it was at 11 AM or 12, the whistle would, this terrible whistle would blow and the people would be crammed on the trains in Westerbork to Sobibor, Auschwitz, as you said, or sometimes Tresenstadt. Um, and they knew that people never wrote again, you know, and they knew they never heard from them again. Um, um, uh, I'm just going to rewind a little bit because um, apropos what people knew or did not know. So I mentioned the Letterman family, this other family, the Hannah, Sana, Hannah, Sana and Anna trio. So Sana had an older sister. Her name is Barbara. She's still alive. She lives in North Carolina. Um, and uh, she um, had befriended um, a young Jewish man who was part of the underground and he became her boyfriend. And he told her, terrible stories of what he had heard from his underground friends about, you know, what, what, what happening further east, what would happen when people were deported east. And he um, told her, you have to get fake IDs for you and your family and you must go underground. And um, she, and, and he says, you know, this it's really life or death. And she recounts this to um, her parents and her father is very adamant about not going underground. He says at one point, I am a lawyer. I have never broken a law in my life. I am not going to break a law now. If we just go along and do what they say, if we just, if we just keep on keeping on and kind of keep, you know, keep our head down, we, as you said, we can, we can sort of ride the storm out was what he thought. In the end, um, the mother did take some money out and pay for, um, pay for, uh, uh, fake IDs actually for the entire family, but ultimately it was um, only Barbara that went un underground and hiding. Um, and it was she who would send the family packages from outside into Westerbork when they were finally in, when they were in Westerbork. And tragically, that whole letter from the family, Sana and her parents were deported yeah. and killed. And so they were all picked up in June 1943, summer 1943, right. the Amsterdam basically becomes um, Judenrein. The Nazis pick up almost everybody else who's remaining, including people who have these privileged exceptions and take them out of Westerbork. Hannah's there for what, seven, eight months, something like that. Seven months. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. she and her father um, and sister are transported to Bergen-Belsen, which at the time, which was a, it's hard, it's hard to, for us to even kind of wrap our heads around this now, I think, but at the time it was a better, better situation than being taken directly to Auschwitz because they were able to, they lived in this camp for, again, this slightly camp under slightly better conditions for prisoners who um, were considered for, ex, you know, being exchanged for right. um, German prisoners of war. So tell us what happened, uh, how she encountered Anne again in Bergen-Belsen. 
Right. Um, so she's at, she's in Bergen-Belsen this time. At this point, she's been there for quite a while. Her father had called it the ideal camp and had been sort of like glowing with his explanations of how it was going to be this special, special place. As soon as she got there and saw the German shepherds and saw the Gestapo and saw the whips and saw the and saw the treatment and then was herself made to spend like with everybody else, hours and hours and hours on these terrible um, appels. They were called these counts. Um, and, and just a reminder, she was there with her, with her sister. So her sister is two years old, two and a half when they are deported to first Vesterbork. By the time they're, by the time they're in um, Bergen Belsen, she's about, she's three. Um, so she's there. Her mother has since, by the way, died in childbirth shortly before deportation. So she's motherless. <laughs> um, and she's been living in Bergen-Belsen um, in these pretty grim situation, but of course it's not as bad as some other parts of Bergen-Belsen. Um, and she, um, there, at one point in about February of 44, she hears, um, uh, sorry, February 45, there is a tent camp that is erected near her camp. And um, all the women are very curious, like who are the, and there's all these women coming into this tent camp. What they don't know is that basically, you know, um, the Russians are approaching from the east and the Germans are trying to get people in uh, from the camps like Auschwitz and bringing them into Germany. Um, and so they some come by mar by those terrible death marches that some come by train. Um, and Anna and Margot, it turns out, have come by train from Auschwitz to Bergen-Belsen. And um and um, so there's suddenly the, the population of Bergen-Belsen starts expanding like multiple times. And suddenly they're, you know, they're being crammed into smaller quarters and there's less food and there's less water. And the situation is becoming quite dire. Um, and they are forbidden from approaching the fence, um, which, which on the other side is this tent camp um, on punishment of death. But women being women or being human, you know, are hungry for information, hungry for connection. And they start hearing voices. A lot of the voices are Hungarian or Polish or Greek. I mean, it's a whole sort of mishmash of, of Jews from all over Europe who have been brought there. Um, and then all of a sudden, one day, they some of them start hearing Dutch. And most of the women in, in Hannah's side of the camp are Dutch. And so there's some inquiring going on and some, you know, um, whisperings across the fence. And lo and behold, a woman from the neighborhood who knew Hannah comes to her in the barracks and says, your friend Anna Frank is on the other side of the fence. She's in the tent camp. And Hannah is incredulous. Hannah's like, no, she's not. Hannah, Anna is in Switzerland having hot chocolate with her grandmother. She's ice skating. She's skiing. She is in Switzerland. I mean, it has given, given her great um, sort of comfort knowing that Hannah, that Anna was safe all of this time, you know? I mean, just to rewind a little bit, you know, back at the Lyceum, every day there was a missing child. There was a missing teacher. Every day somebody else was just gone. You know, one day, um, one of the, their history teacher, a history teacher came in um, and he was reading from them uh, um, a, a famous story and, um, and, and, and it talks about um, a great love affair and he burst into tears and he leaves the room. It turns out that his own wife had been, had been caught that day and arrested by the Germans. Um, and uh, they had never, of course, seen a, a, a teacher burst into tears before. At any rate, um, so she, she, she was very, you know, well, all these friends, some are going into hiding, probably, you know, she knew that some of them were probably going into hiding and some, but some were being deported, but you never really knew who was what and what was going on. But Anna, she knew Anna was safe. So all of a sudden this woman comes to her and tells her that her best friend, Anna Frank, is across the fence from her. She was horrified, you know, she also didn't believe it entirely, you know? So she sets out that evening, um, despite being more not to by the women in the barracks who said it was very dangerous to do so. Um, she sets out, um, in the mud in the cold and her jacket that she's been wearing, is getting creeping up on her sleeve. That's getting, you know, she's growing and her jacket has not grown with her. And she approaches the fence and, um, she says a little quiet, hello, 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 anybody there? And she, um, she hears on the other side, um, a voice returns to her. It's the voice by chance of August von Pels, the woman who's been in hiding with Anna and her family. And um, she knew Hannah because they were same, again, part of that same circle of German Jews living in the same neighborhood back in Amsterdam. And she says, <laughs> as if sort of like it's a regular day, like you must be here for Anna. I will go bring her. <laughs> and she says, Margot was too sick to come though. 
And so she sits there waiting on the other side of the fence. And mind you, an important thing, because the Germans didn't like this chatter, this cross fence chatter, they had stuffed the fence with um, straw. So you could no longer actually see who you were talking. You could never, you couldn't see any, but you could hear. Um, and so a few minutes later, Anna comes to the fence and she, they start basically, they, 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 they exchange greetings and, but mostly Hannah's just saying, how can you be here? How can you be here? So there they are at, on either ends, on either sides of this fence, these two little girls, you know, who once knew lots of love and good family and good food, both very hungry. But, um, and Anna starving, absolutely starving. Hannah at this point would start be sort of in starvation mode later in her story, but not at this point entirely. And Anna is just wailing. I am all alone. I am all alone. And she says that Margo was very sick. Um, and she begs Hannah for some food. She says, can you please bring me some food? And Hannah without hesitation says, yes, I will bring you food. Although in that moment has no idea actually how she's going to bring her any food, but she says, yes, she also just wants her to stop being so upset. You know, um, she's trying to console her and says, don't worry. I will come back. And she creeps back off into the darkness, in the mud, in the icy mud, in the cold, and goes back to the barracks and tells the women in the barracks what she's just seen, which is, you know, the sort of broken version of her best friend, Anna, um, and how her voice is different. It's not the same Anna's voice. Like she feels her, she can't see her physically, um, but but Anna has described to her that her head is shaved, that she's just wearing the black and white gar prison garb. Um, and, um, and that she's freezing and she goes back and tells this to the other women in her part of the, in her, in her barracks. And in what I think is really, truly a story of family, of, of women's solidarity, they scrape and scrim and try to collect uh, a package for Anna. Um, just, um, about a week earlier, they had gotten their one set of, um, rations from the Red Cross at the side of the camp, which included, you know, some, um, uh, dried bread and dried fruit. Um, not very much, but whatever they had sort of squirreled away and saved for later, they put together, they pulled their resources and put them together in a sock. <laughs> and, um, Hannah went back, um, it was the, the next day or two days, two nights later and, um, goes back to the vents, calls out Anna's name. And Anna comes to her and she says, I have, I have a, I have a package for you. I'm going to throw it over. And Hannah hurls it over this fence, um, you know, with the, with the um, barbed wire <laughs> um, over it. And she hurls over the fence and she hears, she hears some footsteps and then she hears a scream and a cry. And it's Anna screaming and crying. And she's saying, she stole it. She stole it. She took it from me. It's a, a Hungarian woman who's on her side of the fence who has stolen this little food package. And, and, and Anna is just beside herself, you know, and she's incredibly understandably upset. And Hannah says, shh, 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 I will come back. I will come back again. And, um, and uh, she again creeps off into the night and then again comes and then goes back and again collects with little bits and odds of pieces of something she can find and uh, returns to the fence, again calls out Anna's name in the darkness. Anna reappears. And this time they're a little bit more scientific about it and try to triangulate. I'm here, you're there, I'm going to throw it now. They have a plan. This time Anna catches the food. And, um, and with that, they, you know, say goodbye and see you soon. Um, but what happens the next day or in the next couple of days, um, is on, uh, is that Hannah's father, who has been very, very ill in an infirmary for a very long time with, with a lung illness of some kind, um, um, he, he dies, um, and he doesn't just die. He dies on the very morning that they are supposed to be their long awaited transfer is supposed to happen. As you mentioned, they were exchanged Jews. They're in this privileged part of the camp because they were going to be exchanged German prisoners of war for British prisoners of war. Um, and they had two things going for them. You mentioned the passport, which is correct, but they also had something called the Palestine certificate. Um, and that sort of connects to their, their uh, activism and the Zionist movement. So they had a Palestine certificate, which was going to assure them passage to Palestine um, if they were exchanged. And so this was about to happen. Hannah and her little sister and her grandmother had their suitcases packed. They go to the infirmary to pick up their father, uh, the father and the father dies that morning. So it's this incredible like grief of his death, but also this, 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 this hope of being exchanged has been snatched away from them. 
And Hannah sort of does her version of Shiva, you know, of the Jewish ritual of mourning. She sort of stays in her bunk for a couple of days, a few days. When she emerges out again to find Anna, the tent camp is gone. They've moved Anna and Margot to a different part of the camp. Um, but she keeps looking for her. She keeps looking for her later on when she ends up taking this terrible 13 day train ride through the German countryside. Um, the very, very last terrible days of Bergen Bells and anyone who was still basically alive, you know, there was skeletal and hungry. And so anyone who was sort of, who could walk were put on these trains. The idea was that these trains were supposed to go to Theresienstadt where they would be killed. Um, so even into the last moments, the war, you know, the Russians were closing and the Americans were closing and they heard, they heard the war over their heads um, the Germans were still trying to kill Jews. Um, and she was on this terrible train. But even at the train, even at the, at the railway station, for the, she was looking for Anna and Margot all the time, hoping she would catch sight of them. I think, you know, that story is so extraordinary. And I think part of what makes it, part of what, what the sense of Hannah's personality that arises from the book. And I think it's important to say also that, you know, we're telling, obviously, you've told this really tragic story of, of Hannah's life. Um, but it's not a tragic book to read because it's filled with these, you know, kind of, I, I don't want to say uplifting, but the, the encouraging moments um, where Hannah does come into contact with people, with people who take care of her. Um, and of course, the whole time she's taking care, as you mentioned, she's taking care of her little sister um, who's, you know, between two and four during this period. So extraordinary. Um, and we see her trying to take care of Anne in the camp. And there's, you get a sense of her, um, of her great um, capacity for, for caregiving, for, you know, for resourcefulness, um, for making, you know, for somehow trying to find a way to survive under these conditions. And, you know, before we wrap up, I wondered if you could just say a little bit about what the process of working on this book with her was like, what was, what was she like to work with? Um, what kind of sense did you, was, what was she like in her old age? You know, was, was, right. was she like, was she the same? Yeah. So, so it's so interesting that you mentioned the caregiving because when she was in Vesterborg, she's given, um, she's in the mail is sent from a beloved neighbor, a beloved non-Jewish neighbor, a book, and it's the biography of Florence Nightingale. And she reads that book, you know, over and over again. And indeed, she becomes a nurse later on and she is caregiving and she's she's a caregiver in her blood. You know, um, she was caring with me. She was caring with everybody she was in, involved with. She was a caregiver to a very large family that she ended up having later on in Israel. Um, working with her was really a labor of love. I had actually met her by chance about 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, when I was reporting for the Associated Press in Jerusalem, um, a young young reader version of her uh, story came out as a slim biography by Allison, by Allison Gold. And, um, and I was sent there to interview her. And like many girls, I think, who grew up, you know, and, and encountered Anne Frank's diary, I felt like I knew Anna. I felt like she was my friend too. I, I remember sobbing real tears, like wetting my pillow because I cried at the end of the diary because I felt like I'd lost a friend. And so I was so overcome by the idea of meeting an actual real friend of Anne Frank's uh, when I was sent on this first assignment. So I'd met her 20 years earlier and I was very moved. And it was the fence story, which had always stayed with me all these years later. And when I sat down to interview her, um, I just found an incredibly smart, savvy, um, warm person um, and uh, who really felt it was her mission to kind of do what Anna was not able to do. You know, she always talked about how Anna wanted to travel the world and would come to her house for sleepovers with a suitcase, you know, and Anna who wanted to be a writer and wanted to explore and wanted to be out there. And, um, and, um, and she wanted to tell Anna's story about, she wanted to tell the story of Bergen Belson. You know, we, when you read the story of the diary, the, the, you know, the, the, the story ends at the day of the arrest, you don't see the sort of the world outside. Um, and although Anna, Anna in her diary, you know, writes about, about Hannah, she calls her Lise. Lise was one of her, her name was Hannah Lise. Um, Hannah Lise was, one, Lise was one of her nicknames. And she writes, remarkably, she writes about, 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 about Lise and worrying for her and, and, and feeling like, you know, she's the one who's safe and, and Hannah is the one who's not safe. And of course, in the end, the tables were ultimately turned. So she felt this real sense of mission to tell Anna's story um, all throughout the years. I and mean, even in her last year of life, when I met her, she was quite frail already. She was 93. Um, she, you know, um, she used oxygen every day. She was not very mobile, but she was so alive when she told these stories and she would, we would, um, 
and we, we would sort of at about the two hour mark of interviewing two and a half hours and we would meet every morning. She would say, okay, I'm too tired. I think we have to stop. But then she would keep talking. You know, she sort of seemed really energized by, by our conversations. Um, but they were also difficult for her. And I, I knew that they were difficult for, for me, you know, absorbing them and trying to take them in. And um, I told her once, you know, I'm having nightmares, you know, about what you experienced. She's like, I am too, you know, like we were sort of, you know, she was reliving it and I was sort of reliving it through her. Um, but I, I, what I most appreciated about her was her, 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 um, her sort of no nonsenseness. She was just like very down to earth, you know, and very, as they say in Hebrew, tachlis. And I think that sort of helped her survive later on. And she created this incredible family. She was a mother to three, a grandmother to 11, a great grandmother to like 32 by the time, or 31, I think the time she died. And she was a very active grandmother. Every time I was visiting her apartment in Jerusalem, there was some other grandchild or great grandchild coming through the door. She this, she's this wonderful, um, all of her grandchildren are wonderful, but um, one of them named Tali has an especially close relationship. And every single day she would visit her grandmother. She lived in the same neighborhood. She wouldn't move because she wanted to be close to her grandmother. And she brought her her young children to visit her every single day. Um, and, uh, and she was always up for something. She was always up to go to a cafe. She was always up to go to see a, an event. Like she was very social. Um, when I got to see her, it was sort of during COVID and she'd been aged also through COVID. She, she was going, moving more slowly, but she was so interested in the world. Um, she, the, 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 uh, the women, the uh, sort of news out of Iran, the women demonstrating in Iran um, after the death of that young woman because of her, her uh, hijab. She was so curious what was going to be, what was going to be. And she was always so curious about the world and the news and, um, and, and that caregiving that she gave, you know, throughout her life, you know, um, as, as, as a young person, but also later on, she was a nurse. She was very dedicated in her life as a nurse. She was a children's nurse in Israel. And she specifically worked with immigrants who'd come from, um, from North Africa and from the Middle East and from India, Iran, and she helped them sort of acclimatize to Israel um, in, a, in sort of a modern a modern setting in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Well, it's obvious that, you know, obviously she was, she was Anne's friend, but it's clear that um, her life was extraordinary on her own for her own, her own person, her own identity. Um, and it's really wonderful the way that you've managed to um, to help her tell her story in this book in, in such an inspiring and moving way. So I think that's a great place for us to end. Thank you so much, Dina. It's been wonderful to talk to you about this. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you. 